Und dann kommen wir zum zweiten Teil. Okay, so the second part, which is Docker and Kubernetes monitoring. And like I said, I'm going to talk about the features that are going to be included in 1.6. And on this little pinboard, you see an application, or at least a draft of an application. We're going to talk about that later on in more detail. But for now, if we look at Docker itself, and also just the numbers on the left-hand side, that really shows you that it's quite impressive, actually. And you can also sort of feel like that is something that's going to be very important in the future as well. Containers are a way to sort of define applications and put them in a container and let them run. All of that is very lightweight and portable, so that means it can be rolled out in different environments, and you can also just start and stop them within just a few seconds. If you now look at it from the monitoring perspective, you can tell that if you have Dockers, you can see a clear line between hardware and software. On the one hand, you have the Docker node that is sort of the environment for the individual containers. So it's really just a physical or a virtual machine that is then monitored with the CheckMK agent. And then on the other side, we have a dynamic world of containers where the software is deployed. And that also means that it's really about application monitoring. If you now really look at the whole picture, you have a center with the Docker node, with the containers. The containers are based on images, and that means they're sort of, um, yeah, on images, and all of that is then made available by the demer, daemon. The images are then actually taken from the Docker registry. They're made available on the Docker node. And if you actually want to run containers being the client, you do that using Docker Run or just different possibilities that you have available. And currently, when it comes to Docker monitoring in ChuckMK, this is what we're doing right now. This is a summary. And overall, we have two plugins in 1.5, MK Docker Node plugin, which is monitoring the node information. And then we have the Docker Container Piggyback, which is getting the information. And all of that is working on the command line and is getting JSON output. And then we have host services that is being generated. And what you see here is just a rough overview of the features that we currently have already. So we have different nodes, containers, and images, and we have different checks and inventory data that we're offering. And yeah, there are a couple examples that are interesting. For example, the system status of the nodes, number of images and containers, the disk usage on that node for individual containers, the CPU utilization, memory usage, and status. And then we also have the whole range of inventory data right here. For example, for images, you can see when they were created, you can see the size, and also it's very interesting to see how many containers they're using right now. And from our current setups with these two Docker plugins, we have a couple best practices that are true for 1.5. The best results can be achieved if the agent is installed in the container itself, so the check MK agent, and then is getting the data directly from the container. And in addition to that, you also have to just uh, sort of set up the container as a host. In 1.5, it has to be scripted manually. And with 1.6, it is going to be done automatically because of the piggyback mechanism. Um. And at the same time, we also have a couple of challenges when it comes to monitoring these Dockers. And for example, one of them is that older Docker versions do not give you any JSON output. So of course, that is a bit of a problem. So the older versions, it's a compatibility problem. If they can't do that, then we can't ignore that problem, obviously, because old Docker versions are still our reality right now. And we're going to have to handle that. In addition to that, for specific commands, for example, the um, Docker volumes, their performance issues, and we really have to make sure that we can configure whether or not you want to get that information or not, and also if there are any other options to get that information. 
And because of that, for the reasons that I've just mentioned, in 1.6 there's going to be a new Docker plugin and that is definitely going to solve the JSON problem and therefore also the version problem. And the plugin then uses the Python API, which is being offered, so we don't need the command line interface anymore. And from the user's perspective, it's maybe a little bit more convenient because the two older plugins are deprecated and there's only one Docker plugin that you have to take care of and it gives you all the different configuration options. You can choose whether you want to access container data, whether you want to do it using an agent and also if you want it from the node or not and so on. And the new Docker plugin also has new requirements, so that means you do need the Docker API Python package on your node, and you can actually uh, re reinstall that or install it after the fact. All of that is available in 1.6, and on the CheckMK exchange, there's also something that we've placed there, so that means you can also use the plugin in 1.5. So that's everything about Dockers for now, and now let's look at Kubernetes a little bit more detailed, and again you can see a very uh, strong line between hardware and software. Overall you just have to take care of more objects. So you have clusters, clusters made up of different nodes, and then we also have persistent volumes, and that's what we need here. Then we also have pods being the smallest unit on the other side, and they are then um, collected in deployments and then made available via services. And all the individual objects is what we're going to look at now and what they mean in Kubernetes and how we're going to use them. The cluster is sort of the main component of the hardware. So in Kubernetes, you really don't think about individual nodes anymore, but you just look at the whole cluster, which is a resource, and Kubernetes then uses the energy if you deploy an application, for example, then distributed to the individual nodes dynamically if required. And in addition to that, also storage itself is a cluster component in Kubernetes. That means if you do that, you don't do it on the node, but you just say, OK, I have this cloud storage right here that's being made available to the cluster. Or you can also have local disks, for example, but that's really mainly for test environments. Officially, that's the recommendation. However, it could also be other storage services, for example, NFS or whatever. I mean, there's a whole list on our official homepage what's supported. Okay, if we now look at the other side, which is the software part, again, like I said, the smallest unit that can be deployed in this cluster is the pod. And overall, it is being said that the design should be as small as possible, so in most cases you're going to see that one pod is going to be one container, and there's really no limitation. There's no limitation to one container. It could also be several containers within one pod that can be useful if you, I don't know, have a file system service that needs to be to deployed, then you have one container that makes the data available to the pod, and then a sidecar container that is then using this data. So within all of that, you can sort of differentiate between different jobs. And in Kubernetes, you don't want to look at individual pods, but you you want everything to be in scalable units that can then be adapted later on. And in order to do that, we have this concept. It's called deployment. All deployment does, it just uses the same pods and clusters them. And you can also say, OK, I would now like to replicate uh, this pod four times, for example. And the deployment actually does that. It just makes it where there's always four pods available. So if a pod crashes, for example, then the deployment should make sure that another pod is created. And in order to offer these services, there's microservices and they're sort of like small adapters that you can use if you, for example, if you want to make a pod within a cluster available to the outside, there's different services or pods and they can communicate with each other. 
And all of that is a little abstract right now, and that's why I have this little example right here, and that's also something that we're going to look in our demo version later on. So if you just use this classic application right now, if you just say, OK, we have this front, we have the servers, and Apache and PHP are running, and the user can run requests. And then in the back end, we also have some kind of um, storage, Redis, for example. And then the user could, for example, send a request. So let's say they want to see whatever was written in the guest book. So it can send the request to the front end server that is then automatically sent to a slave server. So the front end gets the data and then sends it to the user. And the same would hold true if you have written requests, for example. So for example, the new entry of a user is going to be updated, and then the user can see that as well. All of that is available in Kubernetes as well. So all you have to do is have to use these individual units, and you just have to put them on a service, a deployment, and then also pods. You have to move them. And that also means that, for example, we have this front-end service right here. So the user is running its requests. And then we also have the deployment right here with individual pods. And the same holds true for the master service and the slave service. And the application overall would work exactly the same, only difference being that that we could say, OK, we would like to make it where it's available right now, the data application, then it, the server wouldn't be requested, but it would just be a random pod that's selected. So one pet pod is then making the data available to the user. And all of that uh, would work with the slave deployment as well. So if you want to access data, you would just choose a pod that is then delivering the data to the front end. What you see here are two benefits. So that means, first of all, it is pretty portable. And that means, for example, if you have to find your application once and it's running in all clusters, then it's very easy to move it to a second cluster. And the second thing is that if you've set up a cluster, you can just add new pods, you scale the application, and you can also do that automatically. And you can just say, OK, if the burden is this high, then we should just add a pod automatically. OK, so this is what this little draft is showing you as well right here. We're going to look, that, look at that when we look at our demo version. So if we just look at it from the monitoring perspective, it's a little bit more complex because you have to take care of more components. So that means you really have more components where you can access data. We have the APA server that is working on all the API requests and the schedule, for example, if you want to know what the schedule is doing. And that is distributing all the different pods to nodes. We also have different uh, kubelets. They are administering all the nodes. And then we also have the Docker runtime that can also be monitored. But this is just a rough overview of this cluster. Another important thing that I'd like to mention is that in Kubernetes, there's also a concept of labels. And that is sort of in line with what Lars explained earlier. So in Kubernetes, you can freely define key value pairs. So you can say, for example, we have this deployment right here, and we're defining a label app GTA. And that means that for this application, this is where it belongs, GTA. So it's not just limited to app. You could also just say, OK, this is a pod from my front end or my back end. This is a database. Uh, pod or this is a front end service that I'm making available. So this is just a general concept. And if you have included that in your monitoring, you can actually do a lot with it. And if you now look at all of that from the user's perspective, we have two big target groups that we have to cater to. So first of all, we have the administrators, and then we also have the developers. And when it comes to the admins, of course, the main question is, OK, how is my cluster as a whole doing? Do my nodes work? Is the cluster still scaling? Well, do I need more resources? Do I have enough storage overall? Do I need more? cloud storage or whatever. 
And in order to monitor everything in 150 plus, there are different features that you can see here. So for example, you can look at the clusters and you can see if all the individual components work. There's a scheduler that's part of that as well. And you can also monitor the resources, the different spaces, roles, namespaces, storage class classes that are making the storage available. And when it comes to nodes, for example, you can also check if the node itself is ready, if there's any memory pressure, disk pressure, the individual resources, and then, of course, also the persistent volume with storage space. So that means, OK, is it being used or not? Are there any claims? that aren't being used right now. On the other side, we also have developers, of course. They're very much focused on their, um, yeah, on their developments and whatever they're doing, so their applications as a whole, right? So they just want to know the load on their front end and so on. Are there any errors there? And do I, for example, have to add more Redis slaves so that the application can scale easier. And in order to do that, in 1.6, we've developed some features, features that when it comes to services, for example, you can also check your ports. So that means you can make sure that your ports um, are of the expected value. And you can also see if the load is set properly, also if there's enough replica within a deployment, and also if the update strategy is correct. So if you really want to switch from an old version to a new version, you just want to run this update, for example, you could say, OK, I want there to be at least two thirds of the pods that need to be there after the update, and at most, uh, more everything on top of a third can be scaled. And all the way at the bottom, of course, if you want to look at details, you want to know if there are any errors. So for example, again, you can look at the resources and you can just see if all the individual containers are ready for debugging. It could be very important to look at the pod ID. You can also see which node the pod is running on. So you just get an overview of all the different applications. And when it comes to all of this, the Kubernetes special agent is being used. And there are different data sources that are being used. For example, the kubelet of the different nodes, the Kubernetes API. Most features are implemented in 1.5 plus. And for 1.6, of course, we're also planning on new adapters being integrated. One thought, for example, is to have the uh, Prometheus adapter and, of course, also other API data. Okay, so this is just a, a summary again of what I just told you. So 1.5 plus, um, this is what's included in 1.6, of course. This is what's going to be available. So this is then driven by the configuration daemon. So we can just have more dynamic pods, deployments, and services. And of course, they can be integrated in monitoring automatically. And what's very interesting is that, of course, you can also structured a lot better. So that means we can get a better overview of different applications. And I think Matthias is going to tell you more about that, the aggregation, also the new visualization options that are going to be available in 1.6. So all of that can just look a lot nicer as well. Um, yeah. So now this is the demo part. Okay, so we're now going to look at our fictitious guestbook application. So I'm not sure if you can see it all the way in the back, but we have a user that is requesting data from the front end. Then we have the deployment with individual pods under it. We have slaves that are answering the read requests. And then we also have the master that is um, working on it. So in order to visually show that properly, we also want to show it in the Rancher. Rancher is a cluster management platform. So that means within Rancher, you can use different Kubernetes clusters from different sources like Google, Azure, Yes, and what we see here is a cluster with one node that's running on my laptop in order to make this demo safer. And 
If you look at the cluster, we already deployed the guestbook application. So all of that is done in the test project. So what you see here is that we have this front end service. We have the Redis master and Redis slave. And if you now click on the drop down menu, you can see three round circles and they're representing one pod each. What we can do as well is we can use the Rancher GUI and then jump to the application right away. So we can just say, okay, I want to capture a guest book entry. I want to save it. It's then available on Redis, on the Redis slave. And what we want to do now is we want to go to check MK and just have a closer look at what monitoring is like. So in order to do that, we already have the cluster that's integrated in the monitoring, and we are now asking the data source program in order to have short responses, we're gonna just access it every five seconds. What you see on the right-hand side is the newly featured labels. So those are just a couple of labels that were added from the node. So you can see, for example, that I have one node on here, and this node also has to run the data storage of Kubernetes. Okay, and in addition to that, we also have the DCD connection that was set up, so that means we can actually use the host and access the configuration and look at the connection. And we have a piggyback connector that was set up, and we have very short intervals, they're just one second in order to access the data, and we're discovering services automatically. At the same time, we also want, if projects are gone, we want to see it and we want to do it using the cluster. Okay, and if we now go to the user view away from administration, we can just choose Kubernetes and then in 1.6 you have new options so you can just see what kind of objects you want to look at to get nodes. You can just say services, deployments and pods. You can just add that and save. And now the DCD is running in the background and it's collecting piggyback data and within a very short period of time we should be able to see that new objects are included in the monitoring. Of course there's a lot of objects today because it's all Kubernetes objects plus deployments of our guestbook integration. So now we've already captured the data right here and it's still a bit of a work in progress at this point in time. That's why we have to start the core again, because we're actively still working on the hardware and software inventory data that's being created that should be implemented. But once we've done it, it's going to definitely happen automatically in one six without restart, obviously. And we can see labels right here. These labels are very interesting because we can say, for example, OK, we want to look at our backend again. And in order to do that, we can just say, OK, we're going to click on the label. Once we've selected the label, we see an overview of all the objects using the same label. So that means we can see right away that there are two deployments, Redis master, Redis slave, we see the different pods that are part of the deployment and we can also see services that are presenting it to the outside. And if we look at the slave service, for example, we can see that a port was recognized. We can also see that the port is called 6379, it's being offered to the outside, it's mapped on the different ports of pods, and we can also see that there are different hardware software inventory data, so we can see what kind of pods are part of the service, and also what kind of cluster IP this service is made available within Kubernetes internally. And if we now look at the deployments as well, we can see that currently for this slave, for the Reddit slave, there are three out of three pods that are available. We see the update strategy. So that means we have a maximum of one pod that can be missing and also one can be added at a time. Now, currently, it's at 25%. And if we now also look at the pod itself, we can see the different resources. We can also see if the containers are available. 
And of course, we can also see different hardware software inventory data. And we can also see the individual container status. We can also see where the part is located. So you can just get an overview of the back end by just using a couple of labels in order to do all of that for our guest book, for the application, and to make it where it looks just nicer. We have this, this little guest book set of rules that was summarized and all of that is including all the different components that we've seen. We have the box back and front and whatever you see here. We also have an application that we've set up and we're going to have a closer look at that now. Okay, so we have our guest book here, front end, back end, and if we open up the back end now, we can see that we have the Reddit slaves in the background, and they're making the service available. We also have the deployment status in the aggregation and also the individual parts. It's very interesting if we say, okay, we want a new pod in our back end. In order to do that, we just go to our rancher GUI and we just say, okay, we would like to use the slave and we open it. So I'm just going to click on this little plus symbol right here. And then you see this little red bar right here that's running. And we're just waiting for the slave. Now it's there. And if we now go to monitoring very quickly, we're going to automatically see that the fourth part was added. So BI aggregation just gives you a live view of the application. We could also just say, okay, in our front end, we have three pods and we really want to scale down. We really don't have such a big load. So we can just say, okay, we just want to exclude pods actively from our monitoring. And we can do that using the Rancher GUI again. So we can just say, okay, we're just going to downscale our front end. Our requirements have changed and we can just see the green bar right here. So that means they're working on it. Now it's there. And we can also see that the parts are being uh, deleted right now. Now the parts are gone. You can also see that the aggregation, there's probably a small error in this check. So we may have to treat the status differently, but overall you just need the live view of the application. Okay, let's now answer questions that are available and a little yeah, sort of idea of what's to come. So we saw that in the rancher you can monitor Kubernetes. All of that works for average uh, Kubernetes clusters as well. And with the 1.5, Plus, it also works for Kubernetes in OpenShift. And in 1.6 in OpenShift, we want to expand a little bit and also the um, OpenShift API so we have more features. In addition to that, there's lots of different topics that are topics that we're looking into right now. For example, we're considering how we can actually offer dynamic dashboards in this application. So that means it probably makes sense to just say for nodes or clusters or also individual applications, there should just be some things that you can adapt that are being offered, you know, so just having greater visualization. And then not all environments make it possible for us to have the CheckMK agent that can be installed. So that means there's another idea that we have right now that we could use a daemon set. A daemon set is a pod that's running on each node. And if you then included the CheckMK agent there, you could also monitor all the different nodes without using the CheckMK agent. In addition to that, we also would have to really look into events in the future. The idea could be to really have the event connector that was introduced already. And we could just look into that and just evaluate that idea and then also the Kubernetes events. So all the events that are directly created by Kubernetes, you could use that to recognize errors, for example, or problems, for example, if the pod wasn't started and so on. You know all of that can be fixed and analyzed. And 
you could also use uh, sysdoc format to send it to an event console, but in order to just get more experience, it would be good. And then, in addition to that, we also have something that would make sense. For example, maybe we should just use more data sources. One idea could be to integrate Prometheus, um, because the data is running anyway, so why shouldn't we use them? And then there's also other orchestration tools. For example, it could be interesting for small environments. Um, Docker Swarm is being used, and then for big environments, we also have Apache Nesos. And in addition to that, we're also considering whether or not not the metrics strategy could be changed. That StatsD, which is a tool that could also be integrated in CheckMK. Yeah, that was everything. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I have two questions. The first one is about exporting. So you can use exports to get metrics out of containers, as the name says. Will the special agent be able to handle that as well, or will you leave that to Prometheus to check these exports? And then the Prometheus adapter has to be used. Well, the current idea is to have everything into the special agent. It should be integrated in the special agent. So the idea of picking up exports, whether how that can scale, whether this needs to be um, external, we would really have to look at it in detail. Second question would be, I understand that OpenShift support is coming with 1.6. Yes, the OpenShift API, so Kubernetes and OpenShift can be requested already. So OpenShift can be requested right now already. Well, there are two parts to it. There's the standard Kubernetes API, and then there's this extra part uh, for their features. The standard part can be requested. The extra part, like user management and smaller things, uh, that they would have to be actively implemented. But that is something that, that works parallel to the Kubernetes API. I have a short question about this entire Docker container thing. You said I have to put a CheckMK agent into the Docker container. Is that correct? Yes. So this uh, requires a close cooperation between development and monitoring, right? Because they would have to, to create the Docker containers accordingly. Yes, we have two mechanisms. The best way is to have the agent in the container. As a second option, one could have the agent on the node and uh, run it within the container. But there's uh, less performance in that. Is that also true for containers that are in Kubernetes nodes? Well, the example for the cluster I just had, I had the CheckMK agent running on it. I had the Docker plugin that I used. So this could also be put in there. Kubernetes for itself does not offer requests through the containers directly. You get certain container metrics, but direct requests to the container should be done by the plugin. I have a question about the requirements. You said that you need a requirement for the uh, request from the Docker, that these two agents, plugins, uh, basically merge. Is, is, isn't it like a step away from uh, automation or automation and, and the automatic agent updater? Shouldn't this install? Shouldn't this install the requirement automatically? Well, yeah, there are separate issues. You're right. It's a complicated question. It would be nice to have an automatic host um, with an automatic rollout of the plugin. There is a uh, talk on that later. Maybe there's there's further room for integration, but yes, it would be a good idea to have. 
maybe like no matter whether you use the agent battery or the the uh, startup packages it's not the task of the bakery in your system to install any modules globally we would not want to go down that path no other component does it that way so this is a step that needs to be taken if you need the plugin to automate that is certainly possible but you need to see in the local environment how, how one could do it and it's also a question how dynamic this, this thing could thing could be because a node is quite static it remains the same so when you have a node it's not that painful to install the plugin I mean if you want to execute a step for every container that would be quite different Yes, I have a question about the metrics. You mentioned uh, that in the future there will be tools for metrics. My question is, uh, there was the option to uh, have the agent create checks automatically through scripts. Will this also be possible in a Kubernetes environment? I didn't quite get the question. So, for example, we have an application that creates scripts for the agent, SMB checks, and they are being transferred into water automatically. And my question is whether this or something similar would also be possible in a Kubernetes environment. We haven't looked at this in detail. We would have to see whether this could be implemented. We can we can talk about it later. The CheckMK agent within the container would work like any um, CheckMK container, right? So if I build a check there, yes, in a container that should work. Also about CheckMK agent in the container. Also with the plug-in and the special Kubernetes agent, you need a agent in every container, right? No, it doesn't have to be, but it can. The plugins, let's put it another way. The best performance uh, is being achieved if you have the agent in the container, but you can also request it via the node. Hello. For Kubernetes and the shift integration, are you looking also into resource limits? Yes. So an over-provisioning of nodes uh, could be mediated through Tekken right? We can look at the cluster for a second. Maybe that answers your question. There you have CPU resources, for example, and you can see here the requests, how much is allocated, but what's the capacity? If there was a limit, you could see that. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I have a short question. Who is actively using Docker in here? Oh, there's not quite a few. And who's using Kubernetes? That's not so many, but it, it may grow in the future. <laughs> yeah, okay. OpenShift, auch noch dazu. OpenShift perhaps? Und oder OpenShift. Uh, Kubernetes and or OpenShift? Naja, okay. Dann, danke euch. Dann, so, Tom, danke. thank you. Tom, thank you. Und dann gehen wir fünf Minuten früher in die Mittagspause. Yeah. And then we have our lunch break five minutes early. Yay!